Who was having trouble with CPU number eight? Who did it crash on? It was, okay, we found out why. The reason CPU 8 was crashing is, of course, all the CPUs are in deep freeze, which means they can't modify the disk image. And the disk had a bad sector. So the system manager unfroze it, ran disk check. It's all better now. However, however, so you can use CPU 8 again. It's not crashing anymore. However, Experience shows that when a disk starts getting bad sectors, it could happen again. So if you, you are using CPU 8 and it blue screens, if CPU 8 blue screens, I want to know it because we'll replace the disk. <clears throat> so we're considering, on a completely separate topic, we're considering opening up the lab for a couple hours on Wednesday morning. How many people would like that? Holy mackerel. 10 a.m. to noon? Gulp? So it'll be either Pavel or I. It'll go on the, it'll go on the consulting schedule starting for next week, since we're past that now. Any questions about lab one? How are we supposed to put that like the first one thousand like which is the initialization for the best performance uh -huh. into the microcontroller? Because currently I put in the initialize section which means every last Every time I turn the power off, turn it on, you get initialized. Don't do that. Yeah, I, I know that's not, not the correct way. But right. So the only way you can you can do it, the only way you can initialize EEPROM once. Yeah. Well, there's actually two ways of doing it. One is to write an EEP file, an EEP file, and then when you program the CPU, the EEP file will be auto downloaded into the EEPROM which will initialize it to whatever you want. That's the box under the flash program, right? Yeah, someplace in there, yeah. But what's the syntax? What should be syntax? Oh, I don't know. You'll have to look it up. Okay. The other way to do it, which is what I suggest, and, and what my example does, by the way, is to use a flag, a true-false flag. And so the first thing the CPU does is to read flash. If it has never been and that flash, EEPROM, reads EEPROM. If the EEPROM true false flag has never been written, has never been written, then it will be false. And if it's false, you write an initial value, 1000, and you set the flag to true. The next time you boot, you check it, and the flag will be true, and it will not write 1000. Another EEPROM okay. location, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Does the EEPROM memory space, Bytes, I believe. I believe EEPROM addressing is in bytes. RAM, uh, RAM addressing is in bytes. Flash addressing is in 16-bit words, for confusion's sake. Oh, so somebody else the day before has already programmed it. Well, maybe you ought to use your initials. So if the first four bytes don't say bozo, then you, those are my initials, actually. Uh, then, then you, then you would, then you would program it. If it, if it does say bozo, you don't program it. So you could, you could use three, you could use your initials, and that'd be pretty safe. Or a secret four-digit code. You can make it as secure as you want. 
Or you, could, you don't have to write to positions 0 and 1. Write to positions 35 and 36. Nobody else in the class is going to do that. That's pretty safe too. So I put up a, you should have all gotten a mail, except for the whoever has the Yahoo account, which goes nowhere. Um, everybody should have gotten mail saying that I put up a schedule of how the due dates work. Was that, was that table useful or confusing? Huh, useful? Confusing? Well, that's good. I, I, I couldn't decide, so I'm happy it's useful. <clears throat> Any other questions on Lab 1? Lab 1 has to be demoed by the end of your lab session this week. And experience suggests that in the, in the crowded labs, there's going to have to be a sign-up sheet. There'll be perhaps, depends on what the TA thinks, but I think it probably 10 minutes per, per demo. Too long? Too short? Too long? All right. Well, we'll go for 10 minutes per demo. You'll be able to sign up when you get to lab starting at 4.20 and working backwards. If you're the last one to sign up, you might have to demo at 2.15. So don't linger. <clears throat> Any other questions? <clears throat> Any questions about lab two? It's coming right up. So for the for the Wednesday section, lab two development starts tomorrow. All right. You have two weeks to do it starting tomorrow. So you better you should be on it at this point. Let's see. I think I was talking about timer one last time and the capture mode. And I think I was ready to start talking about the the demo code which you talks uh, which shows how to use timers in three different ways. That sound right? Yeah. Okay, so so we're gonna set up we're going to set stuff up, and I don't know what this, this is going to be some sort of vaguely hardware software-like diagram. We got this, the, 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 the CPU, and just to make it explicit, timer one is a piece of hardware which is talking to the CPU, and the line here represents an interrupt every one millisecond. Timer two, timer two is going to be generating a square wave out of D.7 and it is not going to be communicating with the CPU. There will be no interrupt service routine for timer 2. Timer 1 and in particular the input capture register will be generating an interrupt in which you will, and in the interrupt service routine, you'll be reading the interrupt ca capture register. The interrupt ca capture register is going to be loaded by an event happening on the comparator the, for this program. The positive lead is going to go to the band gap reference which is internal in the chip, in the MCU, and the square wave input from D.7 will be fed into B.3, which is the comparator input, thereby closing the feedback loop here. So we're going to use timer 1 to measure the frequency of timer 2, which of course we already know. But this allows us to validate the measurement. So that's a setup. In your code, 
in lab two, you will not be turning this on. I'm doing this for the demo code. Yes, so there's a matter which factory Yeah, it does matter. It does matter. Right. Because you'll you'll get uh, phase inversions. If you invert the positive and negative, you invert the phase of the comparison. So the structure of this program is the same as the of all the other examples we've done so far. There is a interrupt service routine for timer zero ticking away at one millisecond. Main is sitting there watching timer zero output and executing a task when the timer times out, when the virtual timer times out. We're going to add one thing. In main, we're going to write a chunk of code that executes as fast as possible to pull the uh, ACO bit. ACO bit, the direct output of the, com of the comparator. So I'm not going to write the timer 0 ISR because you already know how to do that. I will write the timer 1 ISR. This is the timer 1 capture vector, timer 1 capture ISR. And when we get to this code, when we get to this entry point, we know that a positive transition, positive transition occurred here and that ICR1 now has the instant that the last positive transition occurred, measured in, of course, timer cycles. <coughs> So we're going to read that. T1 capture equals ICR1. That's doing an, a 16-bit read. It's hiding the details of the 16-bit read over the 8-bit bus. That's good. So we're doing T1 capture equals ICR1. Then we're going to calculate the period of the waveform as T1 capture minus last T1 capture and then we're going to set of course set last T1 capture to T1 capture so the next time you enter this interrupt service routine, we'll calculate the next period. And yes, the first time through this, the period will be wrong because last T1 capture will not be set correctly. in time. Yes, so, so the question is what happens if you can't get back and read this before the next transition, before the next positive transition? That's the question, right? And the, and, and the answer is that you will, you'll miss the transition. And so you always have to worry about can you get back to an interrupt service routine in time? Mostly for the first two labs, your, your CPU loading is going to be rather light. For lab three, you're going to be graded on how heavily you can load the CPU and still survive. And so you will end up running into 
situations where you cannot get back to the interrupt service routine in time because you don't know where the limit is until you exceed it. You can calculate it within bounds by counting cycles in assembly language. Now what kills you are asynchronous events. Let's say that some other interrupt is bouncing along, popping along, interrupting the CPU. Then you cannot be sure in principle that you're going to get back to this in time. There is, there is, there is absolutely no way that you can you can guarantee unless you can put upper bounds on every possible event, upper time bounds in every possible event. And you have to deal with that. Now, a real-time kernel, uh, some sort of operating system, can help with that because you can then guarantee in some statistical sense that events will happen at a certain time. But you can never overcome the crazed user who holds the button down. You can turn off any interrupt anytime you want. So for instance, you could turn off all other interrupts every time you go into this interrupt. You gotta worry about that if you're doing timing, however. So yes, it's a problem. Let's, let's write main out now. So we're going to do the usual initialize, which is going to set up all the timers, but I'm not going to talk about that just yet. But then we're going to drop into a while one loop, the usual infinite loop here. And as one student found, it is a really bad idea to put a semicolon here. <laughs> Sounds like some of the other of you have found that out too. All right. So we're going to do a while one here, and then we're going to do two things. One is, yeah. So when you, when you enter an interrupt, it turns off the master interrupt control bit. But in principle, or if, if you have very specific needs, you could turn off individual interrupts in an interrupt or any place else. You could turn off timer one or timer zero. You could turn off, you could have timer one turn off itself if for some reason you want to only run this occasionally. What we're going to do here is we're going to do two things. One is we're going to schedule task one. All task one is going to do is print the period. The reason for scheduling that and slowing it down is that printing takes a long time. So first thing we're going to do, of course, is say if some time one equals zero and time one is being generated and incremented by um, timer zero, then we're going to then we're going to set time one back to t one. In other words, we're going to reschedule uh, task one and then execute task one. The interesting part here is <clears throat> comes next, and that is that we're going to pull ACO zero as fast as possible. So we're going to define a variable ACO bit is equal to ACSR. That's the analog control status register. That's the register where all of the bits are for controlling the comparator. And we're going to mask this against the ACO bit. So this will return a 1, 
or at least a non-zero, if if the comparator output is one and return a zero if the comparator output is zero. All right, so we need to detect a rising edge on the ECO bit, which means that this value has to be on the very pass through the loop, this value has to be 1 and the last value has to be 0. So if we have the ACO bit not equal to 0 and 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 the last ACO bit equal to zero then we know we've just had a rising edge on the ACO bit So we're going to call T1 pole, P-O-L-E, no, P-O-L-L, -L, there we go, is equal to T count 1. In other words, we're just going to query the timer directly. We're not going for the capture register, we're going for the timer directly. And the period that we measure by polling is then T1 pole minus last T1 pole last T1 pole equals T1 pole And we have to end that and then set last ACO bit equal to ACO bit. And then end and what? And while and then end main. I'm not writing this out this way because it's a good idea. In fact, it is a bad idea to read timer one this way. I'm writing this out so that when you run it in lab, you can see how bad it really is. And in fact, it's bad. Uh, it's off by as much as 10% on a 200 cycle square wave. It's off by as many as 20 cycles. Well, I don't know. It could be the interrupt service routine running. Let's say that let's say that it does this instruction. It takes the timer one interrupt service routine, then does this instruction and this instruction. You're going to get a different result than if it didn't take that interrupt. So so you're you you it's a, it's there's an as asynchronous uncertainty. In fact, sometimes this reads short and sometimes it reads long. The correct way to do it is to measure the period this way. This is good. This is bad. Get it? All right. And the reason I'm, I'm jumping up and down over this is I've had people before say, well, you do, you, that's the way you did it. <laughs> I'm doing this as a straw man to show you how bad it can be. Yes. 
<clears throat> if you said T1 poll is capture register, you still might not because you can't quite tell. Um, there, there's an asynchronous updating the capture register relative to this code, and so it may not be valid. It may not be. It may not be synchronized properly. But that's an interesting experiment. Try it. See how good or bad it is. It's only changing two lines of code. You can do it in five minutes in the lab. It's worthwhile trying. I didn't try that, but it's a good idea. All task one does is to print it out. I won't bother with that. <clears throat> the initialized code, though, is kind of homely, so I'll write it out. We're going to set up timer with zero the same way as we have in other, every other program, so I'm not going to write that. For timer one, we're going to set TCCR1B, control register B, to turn on the capture, which is the input capture edge select bit one, and add one which sets the prescaler to full speed. So this turns on the capture, this turns on full speed. We're going to set time mask one to turn on the interrupt capture Interrupt capture, interrupt enable, the ICIE1. And that's all we have to do. Oh, oh no, there's one other thing we need to do to set up timer one because timer one partly depends upon the comparator. So we have to set the ACSR. We have to set the ACSR to connect the comparator to the timer by turning on, actually this bit turns on the band gap, it's the analog comparator band gap, and we're going to OR that with the, the analog comparator input capture bit, the ACIC bit which does the actual connection between ACO and the timer one in, uh, capture input. It connects the output of the comparator to the input of the timer capture. Then for timer two, have we already done timer two? Have we talked about setting up a square wave on timer two already? I have a feeling we've done this before. It was a homework anyway. I won't do that one. Okay, so you can run this code. It'll, it'll print out two numbers on each line. The first one is the result of the capture interrupt service routine, and it, and it is cycle accurate. For a 200 cycle square wave, it reads 200. You can find out what the CPU load is and how long it takes to execute by cutting down the length of the square wave by factors of two, say, until the system fails. Because there will be some minimum width of square wave it can detect. And the minimum width of square wave will occur when you can't get into the interrupt service routine, read the capture register, and get out again before the next edge occurs. That'll happen with, if you're just using the 
the full uh, interrupt service routine interface, it should happen somewhere around 60 or 80 cycles for the square wave. But why don't you try that? That's an easy thing to try in lab also. Decrease the period of the square wave until the interrupt service routine fails. That'll tell you the fastest things you can measure on this CPU. It'll give you a frequency limit. Ooh, that'll give you a practical frequency limit for lab two. Might be an interesting thing to know. Because maybe I didn't think of that when I wrote the specifications. Hmm. I hope I did. I think I said it had to measure to 100 kilohertz. Is that okay? Is that more than 200 cycles? Uh, 100 kilohertz is 10 microseconds times 16. So that's 160 cycles, not 200 cycles. Does it work or doesn't it work? Maybe I'll do an experiment. I didn't actually test it, but I think it works. But, but before you try and program it, maybe you ought to test it. <clears throat> Any questions on this? Hmm. Ah, yes you could. I mean, you can overclock this baby. Actually, the CPU is good to two, 20 megahertz guaranteed at 5 volts. Uh, there is some literature to suggest that you can overclock it to 25 megahertz if you're into that kind of thing at room temperature. If you want to get into active cooling, you could probably get it up to 50 megahertz. You can ask other questions, though. When you overclock it, what is the first thing that fails? And as far as I, well, I haven't done that since the old uh, uh, pre AT Mega days, but the first thing that failed on the old CPUs was timer one. It started miscounting or not counting. The CPU is still running fine at like 20 megahertz on an eight, in an eight megahertz part. <clears throat> Now, a really good reason to overclock would be to, if you could get up to 25.125 megahertz, you'd have VGA clock rate. Ooh. So you could generate a full VGA signal that way. Of course, you don't have enough memory to generate a VGA display, but memory is easy to add. Hang a couple of fast CMOS chips outboard of the thing and clock the CMOS directly off of the clock rather than through the CPU with your own memory address register. And you could probably do full VGA interface. That would be a good final project. It's sort of an infrastructure kind of final project where if, you know, once you got that all going, you'd, you, then you'd want to write a game for it or something. But, but the actual hardware itself would be useful for future generations of students. Questions, comments? All right, well, let's talk a little bit the, uh, about some other technology you need for this second lab. <clears throat> so you need to measure frequency, which is what we've been doing this, this lecture so far. You're measuring frequency by measuring the period of a, of a square wave. And, and because you're putting the whatever waveform it is through the comparator, it will be a square wave. We need to measure resistance and voltage also, which means we need to run the A to D converter. Right? We need to be able to turn on and run the, the eight pins on the chip, eight pins on the chip. You know how to count, you know how to count the 32 on one hand, right? 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. You can get pretty fast if you practice. <laughs> but why would you? <laughs> um, but there's eight pins. A0 through A7 are analog inputs as well as digital inputs. You can use them either way. Um, if you turn on the A to D converter, it's on, actually on by default at, at when you boot it up. If you turn on the A to D converter, then you can measure analog voltages into the uh, A0 through A7 and depending on the reference voltage that you use, so we're going to say 0 to V ref here, you map the input voltage, hopefully, but not exactly. Ideally, you map it into either an 8-bit or a 10-bit number, your choice. And so you either map it to 0x00 to 0xff or to 0x3f depending on whether it's 8 bits or 10 bits. Now there's various nonlinearities and, and offsets and other analog stuff, but generally you can count on at least 8 bits of uncalibrated accuracy here. So the voltage 0 through VREF maps to 0 through hex FF. So a voltage maps to a number. What's VREF? Whatever you set it to. The three VREFs that are generated internally by the, by the CPU are 5, 2.56, and about 1.1. You can set VREF to any value between VCC VCC greater than or equal to VREF greater than or equal to 1 volt. So you get to choose VREF. Now, the STK500 actually allows you to set VREF, but by default it's set to VCC. So it's set to 5 volts by default. And probably for this lab, just leave it there. Yes? Say again? I can't hear you. What did I do here? Greater than or equal to one. Thanks. <laughs> and mumble, mumble. All right. So, um, VREF is flexible. There is a jumper on the STK500. When the jumper is placed on the pins, which is referred to as mounted, when the jumper is mounted, then the STK500 VREF generator is hooked to the pin. If you want to change VREF internally on the chip, you must unmount that pin. You must unmount that jumper. If you don't, you're connecting two voltage sources together. What's going to happen? One of them is going to win. I'm betting on the one amp regulator myself. So don't do that. You can destroy this chip by setting configuration bits in registers. All right? You can destroy this chip with software. So you need to think about every configuration bit.
before you flip the power on. I had a bunch of channel zeros that were blown out, A0 A that were blown out one semester because my demo code, it was a combination of errors, as all the best disasters are. My demo code had used port A as a debugging port and used port A to drive the LEDs, and so port A was set as an output. The students flashed that code right into the CPU and hooked a, hooked a potentiometer to port zero. That's fine until they turn the potentiometer to zero volts, and now that pin is shorted to ground. And if it's set high, as some of them were, pow, the pow output transistors are gone. And in fact, it actually does worse than that. It shorts the pin to ground. And so after that, no analog voltage can be read again ever. It always reads zero or close to it. Blew up about 10 CPUs in five minutes that way. It really annoyed me. And whose fault was it? Okay, so the A to D converter converts a voltage to a number, positive input only, between 0 and 5 volts. <clears throat> it's moderately fast, but not very fast. It runs at full, at full resolution, at full 10-bit resolution. You can, you can get about uh, 10 to the fourth samples per second. You, get, you can get about 10,000 samples per second. That's fast enough for voice and for cheesy music. Um, certainly fast enough for voice because the bandwidth of your voice is fairly low. Do you know what the bandwidth of an old style dial-up phone is? What? Huh? Well, that's probably slightly pessimistic, but not too much. It's actually, it's actually about 200 hertz on the low end. There's a cutoff on the low end. So the Bode plot, remember Bode plot? The Bode plot looks like this, with this cutoff being about 200 hertz and this one being about 3 kilohertz. And all the useful information in speech is between those two limits. It's good enough that you could tell it's your mom calling, for instance. It's good enough to recognize voices. <clears throat> it's good enough that most people don't even notice that it sounds tinny and cruddy because there's no high frequencies. But it also cuts off the fundamental of almost everybody's voice. Male and female voices are all in the range of about 80 hertz to about 150 hertz or so. And so it cuts off the fundamental, or it starts to cut off the fundamental of your voice, where there's quite a lot of energy, but it turns out it carries almost no information, except for onset and offset. Uh, 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 uh. That's all the information it carries, like one bit. <clears throat> so... So all of the useful information is in this range. And so 10 to the 4 samples is fast enough because the Nyquist frequency is 5 kilohertz. You got a little ways there to filter. You're okay. If you are willing to sacrifice accuracy, you can run the A to D converter faster. And if you're willing to run it, if you're willing to settle for four bits of conversion rather than eight bits, you could probably want to run it at 20 kilohertz or maybe even 30 kilohertz. There's a graceful degradation of accuracy with speed. So you can trade off. <clears throat> 
you, um, no, you don't guess, you, you actually measure it. But uh, at one point I had a table of that because I was trying to see how fast I could, I could make an oscilloscope go. And <clears throat> you can certainly get 8 bits at 15 kilohertz. You get 10 bits at, at 10 kilohertz, 8 bits at 15 kilohertz, and I don't remember after that. It degrades fairly slowly. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the structure of the A to D converter. There's a whole bunch of multiplexed inputs. Now this is an analog multiplexer. It's an analog multiplexer. There's port 0 through 7. There's port 0 through 7. There's some other inputs. For instance, the band gap reference comes in here also. So does ground. Why in the world would you A to D convert ground? For noise, for offset. Let's say that there's a one bit error or a two bit error in zero. Zero actually reads zero x zero two rather than zero x zero zero. You could you could measure that and then subtract two from the value that you read. So you you can get the analog offset that way. The output of this mux goes into a sample and hold. The sample and hold is a op amp and a small capacitor. The capacitor holds the charge and holds the voltage for a small amount of time. And in fact sets the minimum bit rate, the minimum conversion rate you can use because at some point the capacitor starts to leak and you lose accuracy. So not only is there a maximum speed you can go, there's a minimum speed you can go. This goes into a comparator. It is compared to a DAC, a digital to analog converter. The DAC gets an input from AREF which sets the full scale and it gets an input from what I'm just going to refer to as conversion logic. But what this implements is a successive approximation algorithm. Have you heard that before? Successive approximation and A to D converter. It sets the voltage, it sets the number to V uh, to to 0, x, 8, 0, and asks is the output voltage greater or smaller than the input voltage. It does a binary search and generates bit, one bit per binary search. The output of the comparator therefore goes to the conversion logic to, con to decide whether the next DAC setting is going to be higher or lower than the previous one. The conversion logic takes an input from yet another prescaler, and this one has to run, for maximum accuracy, has to run between 50 and 200 kHz. <clears throat> There's going to be an AD MUX register which you might guess controls this. There's going to be a AD, oh this is horrible, CSR, and I don't believe there's an, an A and B in there anymore. Oh yes, there's an A there. It varies with the compiler. And then there's a data register. 
So you set the channel here that you want to measure. You set the conversion rate and a bunch of other stuff here, the prescaler, uh, start bits, and so on. And then you read back the value, the number corresponding to the voltage that is on the port pin here. And because you can get 10 bits of accuracy on, a, on an 8-bit word, you have to do two reads or you have to throw away two bits. And next time we'll talk about the register settings. Or you can read that lovely piece of, of, uh, of uh, literature in the manual. It is really hard to understand. By the way, there are actually two multiplexers. And the two multiplexers allow you to do a differential voltage measurement. So I'm simplifying it here. You could do much more stuff with this than I'm talking about. Thanks.